And that's why the vaxxers, the anti-vaxxers employ security. All right, so we're on Skep Track. This is like the third year? It's the third year, right? Yeah. All right. We're waiting for Margaret Downey, so she'll get here at some point. People have seen her. She's in the building somewhere. But here we are once again. So we have a new panel for the opening day, a little earlier than last year, but a lot of people here. I'm glad about that. Um, this year we have James Randi once again. <coughs> And somebody who's another big name, but it's not been to DragonCon before, Jamie Ian, Ian, Ian Swiss. That's my voice from the work. <laughs> and there's Ben Radford, and if and he has like a cool paranormal workshop going on. But that's kind of cool. It's over the paranormal track, which is fun. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> and the guy that has too many jobs, Joe Nickel. <laughs> <laughs> and Daniel Oxen, who a couple of years for the past year or whatever, I've always had to say he's the guy from Junior Skeptic, but now he's an author and he has a really cool book. Does anybody here have kids? Get his book. This is an evolution book. It's really cool. Daniel Oxen. <clears throat> <laughs> and Margaret Downey is a, is a ghost. <laughs> um, yeah, she, yeah. We, need Joe, we need Joe to investigate that. Yeah, the, it's part of an experiment we're doing with the I'm paranormal skeptical track. skeptical about that. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just say this. So we're going to do this pretty loose, this opening session. We're gonna allow, I'm going to allow any of the panelists to tell them a little bit about themselves, what they're expecting this year, and then I'm going to open up the floor for questions, and this year we're doing it a little bit different. We have a stand-up mic, so if you want to ask questions, line up, because that's how we're going to do it. So, we'll start with James Randi. So you're back at DragonCon. You weren't here last year. But yes, well, I, I, you know, I do what I can to help you guys. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, I, uh, when I was here for the first time, uh, sometime back there, I, um, I was quite impressed. I was quite impressed, and I'm preparing a piece even now in my head and on my computer that's gonna go up on Swift, our, our webpage for the James Randi Educational Foundation, yay. <laughs> uh, they have a booth out there. Uh, and it's going to talk about DragonCon because I'm, I'm totally fascinated with it. I, the, this sort of thing doesn't always get to me, but this one does, and uh, I'm very, very proud and happy to be invited here, but I must say the, the technician approached me uh, earlier, and uh, Jamie and I were talking, and he interrupted us to tell us that there's a countdown here that tells us how much time we have left. <laughs> <laughs> At my age, well, I don't want to know. <laughs> how much time do you have then? And I want to know, over. how does he know anyway? <laughs> uh, these things have, uh, have all got to be I just want to make sure they don't mix up his time with mine, that's <laughs> all. <laughs> I don't care about the rest. <laughs> very true, very <laughs> true. But uh, in any case, I uh, must express my great delight at having been invited. And uh, whatever I say here uh, is going to be on record, and I can be assailed, and, uh, and all kinds of things in the lobby afterwards, if you please. But uh, anything that you, uh, you have to ask me, hey, I'm wide open and uh, very frank and honest and straightforward, so ask any questions you would like to ask about anything that I might know about. And uh, <laughs> that doesn't include mathematics, geometry, and a few other things like that. <laughs> other than that, sure, please do. And, and you are the James Randi with an I, not the Y? I am the one, yes. Yeah, it, it, it was kind of... Tell them the confusion. Yeah, uh, well, uh, last night, well, it was around that, about 7, 8 o'clock, um, James Randi was trying to check in. And one of my staff people, I think it was Mike, who's over somewhere around here. There he is. And he saw in the lobby, James Randi is arguing with some people in the lobby. <laughs> he's trying to check in. I'm like, okay, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> so I went, ran down there, and here I, uh, here's Randy with uh, Jose. And they're like, okay, this will be at the third room. I'm like, the third room? What's going on? And 
then Randy told me, well, they booked him in the room, and then they got in the room, and then people came in the room. <laughs> and then they, he went back downstairs, gave him a different key, he went in that room, got all set up, and a, a bellhop opened the door, started to unload luggage that wasn't theirs. <laughs> So then they went back downstairs. That's when Mike saw him, and I went down, and then I called the guy who runs the con. So we came down to the front desk, and the guys, and the people were confused, and the guy said, well, this is James Randy, and he turned around the monitor. It was Randy with a Y. And this guy had like six rooms for a party here at Dragon Con. It was a very good party after all. Obviously. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so yeah, and I was like, oh. So yeah, there's more than one game, James Randi, if you didn't know, which is kind of funny. It was, but I, there's only one amazing one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it was. They didn't ask if you were amazing or not. <laughs> yeah, so that was kind of a cute thing. Annoying, but cute. <laughs> and then we have Jamie, which you can, now you've never been here. Uh, this is my first Dragon Con. Yeah. I've been to a couple of Comic Cons, and uh, but my buddy Adam Savage, we're doing an event together on Sunday afternoon here, and uh, he yeah. said to me, we were drag at Comic Con, and he said, well, basically, he said, this is fun at Comic Con, but the Dragon Con crowd considers the Comic Con crowd the amateurs. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> what were they? So, yeah. Were they far, far less commercial? Right. We're more yeah. Im intimate. Yeah. It's like yeah. So yeah. anybody can like. Sh if you're a big name at Dragon Con, anybody can actually walk up to them and talk to you. You know, things like that. Yeah, it's kind of cool. And does everybody here know who Jamie in Swiss is? Probably. N a only a couple of people. A, so a smattering of nodding heads. Wow. Um, I'm, a, I'm a magician, first and foremost, and I've been a skeptical activist for more than 25 years. I founded the National Capital Area Skeptics in Washington, D.C. 20 years later, I founded the New York City Skeptics. I've written for Skeptic Magazine, I've spoken around the country for the Center for Inquiry, and I am particularly a longtime colleague of Randy's and the James Randy Educational Foundation. I've presented at or performed at every one of the amazing meetings except for one. And um, I am currently officially uh, chairman of the advisory committee to the president, DJ Grothy of uh, the JREF, and I also contribute a co weekly commentary called The Honest Liar to uh, the JREF podcast for good reason, hosted by DJ Grothy. Mm -hmm. Cool. And he, you're, you're doing a magic act next, it's tomorrow? Well, I'm doing a lecture demonstration, lecture, yeah. lecture mm -hmm. and performance called The Illusion of Psychic Powers tomorrow at 7 o'clock, which is a talk about critical thinking, and I will basically define the four types of paranormal phenomena declare them non-existent, and demonstrate, <laughs> and demonstrate them for you all. That'll be on the lobby level of this hotel in the Crystal Ballroom. So it should be very cool. And then a guy who's not no stranger, because he's been coming here since a couple years before we had a skeptic track. I believe that's right, yeah. We, uh, we were pulling together the skeptic track, and it seems like, uh, God, it seems like ages ago, but I guess it <laughs> probably wasn't. 2006. Okay, there you go. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm Ben Radford. Um, I'm managing editor of Skeptical Inquirer Science Magazine, uh, and you know, uh, uh, writer, researcher for uh, Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, formerly PSYCOP. I won't bother to give you the long acronym of that because uh, we don't have the time, obviously. Good old chance. Um, <laughs> While we're out of chance. <laughs> time. But uh, yeah, I mean, I have to say that, that uh, just following up on what what Randy and Derek said, one of the reasons that I, I really enjoy coming to <coughs> Dragon Con is because the accessibility. I mean, you can, you can come up here and you can meet people like, like Joe and Daniel and everybody up here, and uh, there's not this sort of like, you know, don't have your people call me. It's like, hey, you know, go, go talk to Randy. He's, uh, you know, he's, you, you, you might need to, you know, get a stool or something to, to <laughs> sit down with him or bring him up. Or, <laughs> but, you know, he's, 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 he's a bright, intelligent guy, and, and all of us are happy to, to talk to you. And so I think that that's, so it's, it's a different vibe. Uh, it's, it's not just sort of this like, oh, th there's those people whose stuff I read and we can't talk to them. That's why we're here. And, uh, and that's, that's one of the things I think is really magical about this place is that we're all one big community of people who are you know, like-minded and some of us who aren't like-minded and who are less skeptical and, and that's great. We call that the Sheridan. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. The, the, the other track. Does that, if everybody doesn't know, but this is like the first year they opened, a, they started a uh, paranormal track. And that happened because kind of because of the skeptic track, mainly because the X track used to be the only place for the ghost hunters and those people, type of people that when they came to Dragon Con, 
they didn't know where to put them. There was no track for that. And a friend of mine who runs the X track, the, the X track originally started as X track because it was for the TV show X Files. And then they started to do TV shows like The Lone Gunman or Warehouse 13, that type of TV show. But that's what it's supposed to be about. Well, then, when the Ghost Hunters came the first year, they didn't know where to put them, so they put them in the X track. And then, because of that, every other crazy woo woo guy said, Oh, they have a place for me. So they all came. And then, after the last giant debate we had, the water bottle calling Randy a fraud <laughs> instant was a couple of years ago, last time we were here. And uh, the lady who ran that said, told Pat, I have two years, and then I want my track back. And, uh, and then he, Pat called me at the beginning of the year, he said, so there's a guy who'll take over the paranormal stuff. I said, you know what, I like that. I want it to be around, because we can actually maybe get involved or things like you know, Ben doing a scientific uh, paranormal workshop in the paranormal track, which is great, because those people claim to want to believe in that stuff or want to know about it. Well, learn the real stuff. Come on down. Yeah. And so I said, yeah, but not in our hotel. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> I can't rename everybody in the world. So, so, yeah, so now we have the paranormal track, which is over at the Sheridan. So now, you know, the X track is now back to being safe, I guess. <laughs> so that's interesting. So that's kind of fun. And then also, what's funny, if you go through the breezeway, I think today's the last day of it, but uh, I guess it started a couple of days before DragonCon. They're doing the amazing educational meeting in the Marriott. I thought it was kind of fun. And so it didn't have, the, but as Randy pointed out, it doesn't have the explanation point, so it's not related in any not way. Not official. <laughs> <laughs> so we spell amazing with an exclamation point instead of an I, you see. Yeah, so if it doesn't have that. But at least it's for education as well. It's true. So I always thought there was a typo. It could be. <laughs> Sort of like it's film. A purposeful right. type of. <laughs> so, yeah, so if anybody is, I don't know, is your uh, workshop sold out? It is. Yeah, it's been oh, sold okay. out for a couple weeks now. Oh, there you go. Hopefully, it'll be all those people from the paranormal track that want to learn the real stuff. Although the book is still out, Scientific Paranormal Investigation. Yeah, the book's really good, by the way. Thank you. Uh, then, behind, next to him, is somebody that Ben has worked with quite a bit, Joe Nickel. Does anybody know Joe Nickel at least? Ah, there you go. <laughs> Tell, tell people about yourself. No, it works. Yeah. Oh, oh I said, oh, you have to actually speak up. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> That's an old Randy joke. <laughs> actually, I just, I just come to Dragon Con to bask in Randy's glory. But uh, <laughs> no, I, I was just a young kid, um, pretty much, uh, 1969, I think, when I first met Randy. And I was just getting interested in, I was a young magician. And Randy was a great inspiration to me uh, to, uh, you know, I like the idea of going out there and causing trouble. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I've had no better role model at doing that. And uh, uh, Randy still thinks of me as a kid, by the way, so that's refreshing when you get my age. Uh, that's good, that's that somebody thinks of you as a kid. One of the best reasons to have Randy as a friend. That's right. Because uh, he's I, already out uh, of time, so what are you going to do? I've labored to uh, try to use the word investigate. Uh, the paranormal and to, to get away from the word debunker, and I know Randy agrees with me on that, and, but we hear a lot of people use the word debunk. Far better, I think, that we, that we investigate. So when I started, I was a magician and mentalist, and I worked at the Houdini Magical Hall of Fame, among other places. And I decided to go become a detective and learn how to be a detective. So I worked for a world-famous detective agency whose name I'm not supposed to use for publicity purposes. Did it start with a P? Did they used to go after the Jesse James gang? I cannot say. <clears throat> but they didn't exist, right? It was like an like right. urban legend. But I, uh, I went on then to, uh, to do other things and uh, eventually to, to be taken seriously and to learn to write better. I went back to school and got a master's and doctorate in English literature and folklore. So I've, uh, when I work, I, I'm trying to bring everything to bear on the paranormal. I've gone undercover and in disguise to catch phony spiritualists. I've, I've used uh, forensic techniques. Uh, my talk later today is on uh, called CSI Paranormal, and I'll talk about that. I've used uh, the methods of uh, scholarship and folklore, what have you, uh, and, and managed uh, in, in Randy's honor to cause trouble everywhere. Thank you. 
Very cool. And then we have author and you know junior skeptic dude, Daniel Oxen. Tell people about yourself. Does everybody, does everybody here know Daniel Oxen? <laughs> yeah, man. see, you get class. That's pretty good. Uh, well, uh, I'm, I'm Daniel Loxton. I do the 10-page bound-in kids section of Skeptic Magazine. Uh, I work for the Skeptic Society uh, based out of L.A. Uh, I have a book out, as Derek indicated, The uh, uh, Evolution, How We and All Living Things Came to Be. And you're working on another one, right? <laughs> I'm working on several. Yes. Yeah, I've, so. I've, I've got my next five lined up. See? Uh, but the... Uh, um, yeah, I, I, uh, I have my, my toe in, in uh, quite, quite a few tea kettles at this point. Skeptic Blog, I work with Skepticality, uh, Skeptic.com, of course. And uh, uh, I'm just really, really honored to be here to be part of this amazing thing that Derek built. So thanks for having me. No problem at all. As long as you keep coming back, well, I'll keep yeah. doing it. <laughs> well, this year we're going to line up if you have, if you have questions. And so you can start doing that if you want. I'm going to continue and ask a couple of those people, these people questions. So if you have questions, line up. And uh, nobody has questions, Randy. If you don't, then we're out of no, here. Yeah. So uh. There's no mystery to any of you. <laughs> All the, oh, oh, wait a minute, you have one. Oh. There it is. <laughs> At least one. What's your name? Jackie. Where are you from? Bonk. What's your sign? question is I have a, I have a sister who is uh, she believes she's psychic and one day when she was talking to me about we got into this huge fight and I guess my question for you is do you have relatives that believe in uh, paranormal stuff and if so how do you deal with talking with them about certain things well I do and for it I have to admit this now I'm not going to say where she is in the family I'll tell you afterwards later but uh, I have a uh, a relative in my family, by marriage, not by blood, <laughs> <laughs> or DNA, or any of those things, uh, who actually casts runes, uh, R-U-N-E-S. And she uh, also does all kinds of character analysis by uh, uh, sticks and whatnot. It, it is the craziest thing. It's an embarrassment uh, to my family. I, I, again, I'm not related by DNA in any way. <laughs> As a matter of fact, to most of my family, I'm not related to India. I was kidnapped by gypsies and deposited <laughs> at the door. And raised by wolves. <laughs> there you go. But I, I do have that. And it's plays a, a, beard. a bit of an embarrassment uh, because she's, she does it professionally. And, uh, oh, I'm so ashamed. <laughs> How about you, Wait, have you tried to convert her at any time? Uh, no, there, oh, no hope. No hope. No, that's, that's <laughs> Moscow's. Moscow's. Right. No. Uh, I'm trying to think if I... Not, well, also, not by blood. I don't think I have anyone in the immediate family who's a believer. Uh, my wife has two sisters who are uh, deeply religious. Um, and, that would qualify. Uh, yeah, that would qualify. <laughs> And uh, I, yeah, I um, you know, if you're asking how to address that, yeah. um, you know, it actually speaks to a to a much larger question that this that skept that the skeptical community has to has to deal with all the time. And um, I'm a magician, and I sort of, uh, although I'm interested in the whole broad range of subjects that skepticism touches on, and I'm a big science buff and so on, what I mostly speak about directly is my personal expertise. So that has to do, especially with phony psychics and things like this, this yeah. kind of deception. And, um, but the problem is, is that uh, skeptics are often under the mistaken notion that if we just provide the facts, that will change people's minds. But this operates on the faulty premise that people uh, choose what they believe in. Yeah. And people tend not to choose what they believe in, they tend to believe what they sort of need or want to believe, as yeah. opposed to, and not, not necessarily interested in the evidence. And that's why when you start arguing with someone about their belief in astrology, they can get very upset, because we're actually not talking about that narrow little thing that the skeptics are thinking about, about whether you can do a double blind test for the, te the claims of astrology and what the results are and so forth, but rather you're dealing with someone's worldview. It has to do with a much larger picture of how they want to see the world or what, makes their, what view of the universe makes them happy. 
And you're, you're not going to change that by uh, yeah. in any sort of simple way. It's a very difficult thing to yeah. do. It's tough, too, because she's also very anti-vax, and she tries to tell me that my asthma is caused by vaccines. Yeah, and well, that, that, that yeah. would... Um, <laughs> that's about the time I take up weapons, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You do not endorse this. But I also have a 12-year-old sister, and she, uh, my, my, the one who thinks she's psychic, and she doesn't do it professionally. She's actually a ship's engineer and she's been to the Galapagos and she works with scientists but she still doesn't I don't know how she doesn't get it but um, she was trying to explain how she uses like gypsy cards or whatever and my little sister comes up to me and she's like anytime she doesn't get like a prediction right she changes it and I'm like good you know think about that and <laughs> right so well I, our, our like friend uh, other people have useful comments here but I'll very quickly mention that our longtime friend and colleague uh, uh, Ray Hyman one of the founders of Psychop o o always tells a story about how when he was in college and he was doing palm he got interested in palm reading and for a while he, he's, he thought it was a real thing and then a, an advisor a professor said to him well o o because Ray was amazed at all the feedback he was getting and how accurate the readings were and the professor said to him have you tried reversing the readings just just why don't you try one night just going out and saying everything the other way backwards to everything all the what the literature tells you and he went out and he got the exact same successful feedback yeah. and that's what began to uh, lead to his skepticism yeah I'll just quickly add that I in in uh, following up on what what Jamie said that typically if someone comes to you with a belief saying well that's bullshit is not going to help it's not going to yeah. help them. It's not going to make you look good. So what I try to do, uh, especially if it's a friend or a, a loved one, I try to say, well, I'll listen to what you have to say and I'll listen to your argument. Here's another way to look at it. I'm not saying I'm right. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying here's another way to look at it. Is it possible it's there? And if you can plant that seed of doubt, sometimes, you know, uh, sometimes it lies fallow and nothing comes of it. Other times, if you can just c come up and say, what about this? I mean, I I've seen that happen where I've said, is this possible? And they're like, yeah, I guess it is. Like, gotcha. Mm -hmm. I've had, uh, I've had uh, people come up to me, uh, a lady after I spoke at, uh, gave a lecture in Vermont and I remember this lady had wanted to speak to me so she came up on stage after I was putting my slides away and she wanted me to look at some pictures and I, uh, I didn't handle this well, let, let, me, <laughs> let me begin the saying. This what not I, to do. I, I took her pictures and as if this were just an intellectual exercise, I, I, I said, oh, well, this is, this is caused by the camera strap uh, bouncing the flashback and, and these, are, these are orbs, you know, these are caused by. And pretty soon she grabbed the pictures back from me and said, no, you don't understand. My father had just died, and we were getting not just these pictures, all sorts of signs and so forth. And I, and, and I realized I had not handled that very well because I was thinking with the organ above the neck, <laughs> and she was she was uh, feeling things, she was emoting, and and um, so I, I, we often are just ships passing in the night. People people who are, you will not reason people out of something that they did not. Uh, arrive at by reason, that they've arrived at by their emotions. And uh, I, it's hard to do. I don't have a simple formula for you, but the first thing you need to realize is that you're, you're operating on a different mode. And if you can kind of try to get into their mode, what I, what I think I should have done in, with that woman is that I should have acknowledged, asked her what this context was and shown some sympathy and, and so forth, and then maybe gently suggested a possible other explanation, and, uh, but I, I learned, as I've learned just about every lesson in my life, uh, from making a mistake, and it's a long, long list that I've learned from. <clears throat> people, people who are skeptical and associate with skeptics a lot tend to seek out their, you know, people that they have something in common with. They sometimes did develop this this mistaken notion that paranormal beliefs are uncommon somehow that it's something that uh, uh, other different kind of people believe somewhere. But yeah. um, my experience is if you know 10 people, seven of them believe something completely magical. Um, and, and that's true in my family, uh, on, on all sides of my family, there's all possible paranormal beliefs mm -hmm. from, from iridology to the end of the world in 2012. You know, you can just make the standard list and it's mm -hmm. represented. And uh, dealing with that is, is hard. Um, I don't, don't think that I have a, a really uh, good answer for it, but I know that there are bad answers. Yeah. Uh, and I, I've been reminded of one of them recently. Um, 
There was an occasion not too long ago where I uh, scoffed and laughed about, uh, about an especially silly and, and sometimes dangerous paranormal belief um, at a social event without realizing that the people I was laughing to uh, had fallen under the spell of this idea. And these are people I cared about. And they will never, ever ask me for any information on that topic. And I think that's, that's something to keep in mind, that uh, um, you never know who people are. You never know exactly where they're coming from. Uh, so you're never off. You know, if, if your goal is to keep people out of harm's way, then you have to do that job at all times. You know, you, yeah. Okay. Next question. Thank you. No problem. Sure. Um, I was wondering if any of you have ever heard of any studies that anybody's done on the brains of psychics. It's not, uh, you know, I don't think they're getting anything from the out beyond, but I think there are lots of people who are sincere, and we have these machines now that can show what's lighting up in your brain when you do different things. So I'd like to know what's lighting up in their brain when they think they're, you know, feeling something. Well, anybody, anybody doing any studies on that? There are only two kinds of people who are calling themselves psychics. Those who are honestly self-deluded and those that are doing it for money. And they're, they're the, only, okay. the only two kinds that I know of. They're either deluded or they're not deluded at all and they know what they're doing and they're getting money for it. And you cannot operate, as I've answered this question many times in my lectures, you cannot operate as a professional psychic without knowing exactly what you're doing because it's an art like being a lawyer. You can't be a lawyer by mistake. You have to study to do that sort of thing. And you have to learn how to work your way around the problems that you have when you're facing an audience and doing a reading and you're making goofs left and right. You have to accommodate for that and you have to make excuses. So you have to know what you're doing. But the self-deluded people, they, they do the same kind of thing but in a different way and on a different level. They all have their rationalizations they can be absolutely wrong, get the gender and the age of the person absolutely wrong, and they'd say, oh, but there was another spirit entering into it that came to me, and that one took over from this one. So they all have excuses. Uh, but I, I think that that's a very good idea of the brain scan no. kind of thing, where to see where their activity is going on in their brain, whether, no. whether the thinking part is really working or not. Well, but, I mean, but, yeah. but, but, but the, I would the, point the out, machine, but, I, yeah. I, but I would point out yeah. that belief in the paranormal, uh, which is widespread, um, that uh, the person who believes in the paranormal is not there's not something different about their brain than anyone else is. In fact, quite the contrary. Oh, I, belief I belief in magical thinking is the way humans are programmed to believe, and the scientific believing in the scientific method is contrary. Or as one book uh, by the title the title of which in the early 90s was called the uncommon sense. And the scientific method is not a natural way of thinking. It's why you have to invent the double blind test. We, humans are, are innately lousy observers. We all are horrible observers. We make associations, we look for cause and effect, we look for patterns. And uh, you have to invent the scientific method in order to uh, see through that. And that's and why so, magicians are so successful. Hmm. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so, you know, Neanderthal man buried his dead with food and tools 35,000 years ago, and we can at least guess, we don't know exactly what he was thinking, but we can at least guess it probably had something to do with the afterlife, and that's a lo those are long-time habits, you know. If, if, if the day you dance, it rains, you dance for another thousand years for rain because humans are natural pattern-seeking animals uh, and, and natural magical thinkers. And so the believer in psychic phenomena or the sincere psychic practitioner uh, is just someone who I would say, rather than being different than any other human, is actually being very, very human. I'd still like to know what's lighting up in their brain when they do that. It well, might be it's actually going to be a long time else, before uh, you can find out because most of these claims of what fMRIs are telling you about what's going on in the yeah, brain are pretty much bullshit. On it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They're, unfortunately, yes, they're still working on it, but maybe. Yeah, getting there. Okay. I don't, I don't know, but interesting the, question. I don't know about the brain scans, but there, there is some interesting, uh, uh, some of these populations have been studied, like um, um, uh, Joe can probably speak to some of this uh, business of fantasy proneness, and uh, uh, like for example, uh, people who experience alien abductions are especially hypnotizable. There are those kinds of associations that are. Yeah, the whole, the whole uh, fantasy prone thing, uh, 
Um, this is not hard science that, like you would identify the mineral pyrite, but because it's dealing with psychology and human behavior. But, but we now know pretty well that there, maybe 4% of the public is what's called fantasy prone. Now, this is not a mental disorder. It's not, you know, I see skeptics sometimes just throwing the term around as if they know what it means. It has a very specific meaning and a number of markers, but the fantasizer is a, by definition a sane and a normal person. They are within the normal range, but they're over at one end of the spectrum. And I have met so many of these people. They're often just wonderful people. They're colorful. They're, they, you love them. Uh, they're they're uh, charismatic even. Y'all come but, to Dragon Con. But it's from that, <laughs> it's from that group that uh, the, the sincere psychics uh, and spiritualists who talk to dead people and so forth come. Alien abductees are hugely out of that group. Um, the, um, the whole uh, paranormal is, is filled with people who, who you know, talk to the Virgin Mary and so forth, and these, they tend to come out of this group. Uh, it's oversimplification. It's not the one answer to everything, but it's, as I've begun to understand this more and more, uh, we're using a questionnaire with people uh, developed by a couple of psychologists who helped me. Uh, it's, it's valuable data, and those people, you can often spot them. They are a little different, but they are sane and normal. And um, if you kind of understand how they how they operate, you you get a little bit of a clue into the the world that they're living in. It's a great question because I've told people all the time, what we do as skeptics, even though we're very science based, there's no doubt about that. But we're actually trying to tell people to do something that's anti evolution. We're trying to tell people to do not to go against what we've evolved to believe and to be like, which is a hard sell. Trust me. Hard stuff, but we have to remember that, that you can't just turn it off because many thousands of years have made people the way they are, and it is science that they believe this for a reason. Okay, thanks. Good question. Yeah. Uh, um, kind of a two part question. First is directed at Randy. Um, you, you're a man who's very honest, very out there, and you no matter who you anger and everything. And uh, just, this, uh, just this last March, you came out of the closet as a gay man. Um, why, out of curiosity, like, what caused the taboo to not do that earlier? And like, your, like, come out honesty oh. early, because it just doesn't seem your character okay. to keep but something there, in, basically. There was no reason to come out with it uh, Earlier, I, all of my friends, my family, everyone who knows me has, has always been aware of that fact. I didn't have to state it or wear a sign. Uh, Although that's not a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> I should be wearing my pink shirt tonight. Or something. The Amazing Randy! Yeah. <laughs> that's why you call it amazing. You're so amazing. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. Yeah. yeah. That's one of my friends. Yeah, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, there just wasn't any reason for it, but I am doing, uh, my next book is A Magician in the Laboratory, and that's going to be very much autobiographical, and because of that, I wanted to sort of take the edge of it so they weren't suddenly discovering it, because in the very introduction to the book, it's going to come out uh, with my dread secrets. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I thought it was, it was time to sort of prepare the world for it, perhaps. Uh, it, it wasn't a, a momentous decision. I, I didn't have to go through a lot of soul searching if I had one, uh, <coughs> which I very much doubt. Uh, but uh, no, it was just the, uh, about time to do it. it. It wasn't necessary before because everyone who should have known already knew and uh, it, it wasn't a big thing in my life. It's never given me a problem. And uh, so that was, uh, it was just like, I'm, I'm, I'm right-handed too. Oh, I didn't, you didn't know? Oh, I'm sorry, I should have told you, yes. Uh, a few things. Yes, I know. And that leads into the- But you shock easily. Yeah, yeah, that, that shock. That yeah. kind of leads into the other questions about any other kind of like personal life taboos that any of you, uh, anybody else may deal with. And I'm gonna take mine seated. Well, Ben is bald, uh, for example, and he never mentions it. <laughs> <laughs> I have been exposed. Thank okay. you, Randy. Don't make me have to separate you two, okay? <laughs> That's why I put them on either side of you. <laughs> Very cool. All right. I'm an adult, hopefully, skeptic, who has a child 
believer in all sorts of woo-woo because the Florida Public Library system is filled with books on Bigfoot and psychic healing and UFOs, just Very about every library. Uh, giving up the Loch Ness Monster in my late teens was kind of like many Catholics giving up the Holy Trinity. It was really hard. So <laughs> discounting any religious questions, what's the thing in your careers of investigation and skeptical thinking that you had a hardest time saying, no, that's not true? What is out there, you know, aside from the question of religion, that you've most said, I'd like that to be true? You know, whether it's maybe Mr. Nickel with the Mothman or Mr. Radford with the hotel ghost. <laughs> what have you most said, no, that's not true? And, it, and it, been it, sad wasn't, about that. it wasn't Mothman. Well, I was just throwing out some examples. <laughs> I know, a barred owl is a barred owl, but you just. Well, uh, uh, since you singled me out, uh, uh, the. Uh, I suppose the thing that I, if we were voting, the thing that's most resonant with me, and I, I go back to when I was a boy and I remember when my grandmother died and how much I wish that were not the case. And I remember Carl Sagan speaking once very movingly about wishing that he could talk to his dead parents, he said, even if just once a year, to tell them how the grandkids are doing. And he said it in a lighthearted way, but he absolutely meant it. Um, among the most, you know, I think we are driven in the paranormal, I think we are driven by our hopes and our fears, and those are emotions, and that's why we have so much trouble dealing with it intellectually. Um, but if, if uh, most of the hope, hopeful things, uh, we hope we do not die, we hope we are not alone in the universe. And so this starts explaining why we have aliens and ghosts and so forth. And, and the, the, I'm not so concerned about the aliens. Uh, I, I, I don't know what they're up to, so I'm happy to maybe be alone. But the, uh, the uh, ghost thing, uh, that, that's the one, I suppose, that uh, keeps me uh, interested. And uh, I mean, and I think it's pretty much a settled issue as to whether ghosts exist or not. But the romance of the haunted castle, the, the powerful emotions you deal with with people, the psychology involved, makes it just resonant continually for me and, and is one of the areas I like to do. It's not one of the most difficult and challenging fields of paranormal investigation. I mean, uh, haunted houses, psychics, and monsters are among the easy ones and don't necessarily uh, challenge us a lot investigatorily, but uh, they can. I, I agree completely about those sorts of religious ideas. Those are the ones I'm, I most miss, but leaving aside those kinds of ideas, uh, my, my biography is almost exactly the same as yours. I was a passionate believer in all these things that I found in my elementary school library. And, and uh, one day, I found myself in the audience of a, a little science fiction convention uh, listening to a, a kind skeptic on stage, uh, the late Barry Byerstein. And, oh, yeah. and uh, that was, you know, as in junior high and, and uh, came in a believer in everything and, and walked out with a lot of light bulbs and a lot of questions. And, uh, um, Loch Ness Monster was a hard one for me to give up, but but here's the thing, I never really did. You know, <laughs> I'm still looking for him. He's out there somewhere. All these the things that I most most uh, these kinds of wonderful mysteries, I never left them behind. I just uh, I just discovered that there was deeper digging going on than mm -hmm. I was aware of. I found a deeper literature, and and uh, that's that's where I've gone on to. Uh, I'm still chasing the Loch Ness Monster. You know, so. And that's, the, and that's the difference, boys and girls, between uh, um, debunking and investigating. Uh, uh, those who debunk, I've watched them over the years, the ones who call themselves debunkers and go out and debunk, pretty soon they just burn out. They just get so frustrated, so angry, so negative that they just burn out. It's called skeptical burnout. Investigators never do. Um, because there's always another layer. Oh, yeah, yeah, she was caught cheating, but they never explained how she did this trick, or they never explained why she was going to all this trouble to fool people over this whatever and so forth. And they're just layers of it, all of it fascinating, all of it worth doing. And, and I, go, I go back a lot in my work to cold cases, 50, 100 years old, which are awfully hard to, to do in some ways, easier in other ways, but, but uh, fascinating because I'm just a curious fellow and I want to know. And, and that's, that's what motivates every investigator. The real investigators are curious people. And the debunkers aren't curious. They already know everything. That's, yeah, I'll, I'll just add, add to what Joe said, is that uh, I think ultimately what, what drives us in terms of investigators is, is just wanting to know what's there. Uh, and in, in a lot of the, the things I investigate, I don't have a vested interest in it one way or the other. I mean, 
if there's a ghost there, there's not a ghost there. I, in a way, I don't care. I mean, I, I, I want to, I don't, whether the answer is yes, the answer is no, I'm willing to go out there and take a look. And so it's not as if, it's not as if I'm like saddened because the ghost isn't there or if it is there. To my mind, if, if, if it is there, then this is fascinating, this is an important thing to understand for science and for all of us. If it's not there, then the question becomes a, a psychological one, which is why are people reporting and experiencing things that aren't there? So either way, it's a fascinating topic for me. So I can't say that there's anything that I was really sort of disappointed that it wasn't true because it's fast. I mean, it's, there's, there's gold to be mined either way. Okay. Great Thank question. You. Thanks. Next up, Hi. Matt in a gray shirt. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So uh, skepticism in recent years has been making some inroads in the public eye, as we all know, uh, with amazing meetings spreading all around the world, with uh, shows such as the, Phil, the new Phil Plate show that's coming up. So I was wondering, how do you guys think we should use this? How do you think we should maybe advance critical thinking thanks to the fact that it's been getting there sort of on its own slowly? Well, uh, not to say that we haven't had anything to do with that, but... <laughs> What would be your opinion? I guess it would be going back to what you guys were talking about a couple of times ago, what, what's the next step? So how would you modify that now, since we have moved on a little further, I think? I'm a big fan of chaos. <laughs> uh, there was no grand plan that got us to the success, if, if you want to call it that, that you describe. So if there wasn't a grand plan that was going to get us to this point, there sure is hell is not going to be a grand plan that's going to get us to the supposed next point. The grand plan that got us here was uh, grassroots activism. Was, uh, you know, going back to PSYCOP uh, that Randy, among others, began, uh, which is what, more than 40 years ago? Uh, and, you know, dozens and dozens of groups around the world, dozens and dozens of groups that cropped up were sparked in throughout the United States. I started one of those. Uh, somewhat early in that game. And uh, the great thing is, is that when you see in the skeptical movement today, you see more internal arguments uh, and debates about um, non-existent angels on the head of a pin. Uh, it's because the population of the movement keeps growing. And so keeps getting, the, you know, individual in levels of interest get attenuated. Um, and that's all a good thing, you know. Now you, you, you look at, uh, skeptical related meetups, right? And the meetup groups, you know, my wife started a, an atheist parenting meetup group. And it's, you know, it's one of a thousand examples. Mm -hmm. uh, so my attitude would be um, just more of the same, um, encourage that activism. One of the great things about grassroots activism is just finding like-minded mm -hmm. people, finding that there are like-minded people. That is a tremendous value. The greatest single personal value to me of in 30 years of activism has been the friends I've made. Um, hanging out with the great minds of your generation is not a bad way to spend your time in the limited time you've got. Uh, and I think the notion of a grand plan is a waste of time, personally. I'm sure there are many, countless people in the movement who would disagree. Um, and uh, my only other comment to that would be to stop arguing about how we're supposed to do it, because anyone within the movement who claims that he knows how we are or are not supposed to do it is the only fool in the room. Thank you so much. Okay, the next question will be the last question. I don't want you to like, stand around, so you might as well take a seat. <laughs> uh, brief, brief comment since uh, Jamie mentioned uh, superstitious thinking. It is not strictly limited to humans. B.F. Skinner, years and years ago, created a group of superstitious pigeons, locked them in a box, popped up a little food pellet every five minutes, and then he opened the box an hour later, and one of them was hopping on one leg, and one was waving its arm. Um, the interesting thing is after those behavior patterns were established, it was real hard to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. uh, feel free to fact check me. My memory's not completely accurate, but I believe that to be true. That is um, true. My question is, um, from the discussion here, it sounds like most people are in agreement that most of the woo in the world is propagated by true believers as opposed to conscious charlatans. The question is, which group is more dangerous? First of all, the Skinner pigeon was not waving its arm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm sorry. Small detail there, but I, I think it's important. I stand corrected. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. 
some other part, perhaps. Mothman, but, yeah. If it were Mothman, yeah. Mothman had both wings and arms. <laughs> not, not originally. <laughs> well, he, he grew he them later. Which appendage yeah. was he waving? <laughs> you know, I, I'll jump in here. I'm sure every single person on the panel has an opinion, and actually I want to hear them myself, too. But, but um, you know, the ones who are deliberate are the ones that are the most infuriating. But uh, the, the ones that are not, the ones that are not deliberately deceptive, um, that's the world. That's, that's, as I indicated before, that's being human. And therefore, you have to say, I think you have to say that it's, a, that it's the most dangerous. Um, and, so, and that's why the most important thing is to treat, teach people critical thinking. I mean, in the end, you know, debunking magic tricks or, or whatever the case may be, this is not going to change. This is not going to change the world. It's not going to fix the kind of problems we're talking about. Um, teaching critical thinking at a young age, teaching the sci what the scientific method is before you teach kids to memorize the periodic table of the elements. Uh, you know, I, I've spoken at countless critical thinking courses on the college level, and my only frustration is is that um, it's at the college <laughs> level, uh, which is almost too late to start to teach people how to think critically. Um, as I said before, it is an uncommon sense, and it but but the scientific method is the only way we're going to fix problems we have in the world. It's not going to be wishful thinking, and that's, that's the thing we have to teach most of all. It's not always easy to tell whether somebody's a, a charlatan or not. Um, I, sometimes it's, it, it's very easy. I, I went undercover at Camp Chesterfield, and, and the people were doing billet reading, and I knew, I knew that trick, and I used a false name and so forth and caught the guy. You know, he was, he was hold a piece of paper up, but he had, he had the, mine here, and he was actually reading f the false information that I had given him on this slip, so I, I caught him. But I remember this sweet little old lady at, at a spiritualist camp who, uh, who would do sketches, sort of Coney, Coney Island-like. You'd sit down and she'd do a sketch of your spirit guide. The only thing disconcerting was she was looking over your shoulder. She was looking at you and drawing. And I went with a, a false story, and I told her about seeing this Native American with three yellow feathers and so forth, and, and that's what she drew. And now I'm sure, I'm sure that uh, there was no yellow bird, no, no uh, spirit guide of mine. I made him up. But what I don't know is whether she just said, okay, this sucker wants, uh, wants a, native, a drawing of a Native American with three yellow feathers, so I'll give it to him and collect my 50 bucks, or whether she had this rich ability to envision such a figure as I had described him. And, and was, her fantasy was able to, to really visualize that in a sort of way an artist could and then gave me that. And, I, and you probably, with more study, could find out which she was, but I, I didn't know. She was just the sweetest little old lady. And, uh, and I prized my drawing of, of uh, Yellow Bird. I, I'll just throw in, I, I think that, uh, to my mind, it, it's, it's almost an unimportant distinction. I mean, the, the results are the same, whether they're obviously bullshitters or whether they believe it. Um, it's indistinguishable to a lot of people, as Joe said. You, often you don't know unless they confess. Um, you know, there's a great uh, book uh, called The Psychic Mafia by Lamar Keen uh, that sort of talked about some of the, some of the uh, tricks that some of the spiritualists would, would and, and basically magician's tricks they would use. I, would, I, would, I guess I would say that um, on balance, the true believers are more damaging simply because there are more of them. Uh, I, in my experience, the vast majority of people who come to me uh, whether it's ghost reports, Bigfoot reports, believe in their psychic, they're sincere people. They're not crazy. They're not stupid. They they're just they just they they, they simply don't have the, the critical thinking skills. And so I would say that just because they are far more prevalent than the, than the intentional hoaxers and fraudsters, they may be more damaging. Uh, I have to venture to say the one thing I've learned, and if a lot of skeptics, at least I think, should remember this. I think the skeptic movie movement, not a movie. I wish there was a movie. <laughs> that they, there was one called a skeptic, but it was really bad. But <laughs> um, anyway, uh, to me, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong. The thing that skeptics really should do, and more focus on, is the like the concern, consumer issue awareness, because that's really where we have legs. We can actually prove that. Monster Cable is not worth $400. <laughs> we can, if we find a psychic who's actually frauding people, like James Randy, Randy did on The Tonight Show, and people were spending money on that, and, mental, and not just money, mental investment. Those things, I think, is where we actually have power. Trying to debunk things that don't 
really affect people, that just makes people mad. And if you focus more mm. of our energy into like consumer reports, which is actually a very good skeptical magazine, believe it or not, because that's what they do. They investigate stuff and they give you the facts. Stuff like that, at least to me. Am I wrong? Uh, I, I, would, I would first say that uh, making people mad is a perfectly great thing. <laughs> um, the guy to my left made a career, inspired me <laughs> and many of my friends and colleagues by pissing people the hell off. He's really good at it. Uh, I learned a lot from it. I admire it. And uh, it's a perfectly fine thing. And the notion that the day that skeptics have to uh, stop, take as a mission to stop pissing people off, uh, we're dead in the water. Um, now, it doesn't mean we, that's the only thing we should be doing, and it doesn't mean that all of us have to be doing it. If you don't feel like pissing people off, then fine, do something else. I think that I agree with you, to, Derek, to the extent that um, consumer affairs is a strong part of the skeptical movement. I mean, one of the things that, one of the skeptic issues that is dear to my heart, um, because it's deeply infuriating to my heart, is homeopathy yeah. um, and billions of dollars for nothing. Uh, but by the same token, even though you have the facts there on your side, uh, nevertheless, you're also kind of, you know, you're just kind of sh in a shooting gallery, knocking individual things down, and you're not speaking to the cause, which, again, I come back to the notion of a scientific worldview and critical thinking, right? So you can be knocking those things down, those ducks down from now to doomsday. It doesn't really change the world. Um, but I also agree with Ben in that ultimately intent doesn't matter. That's actually an important point. I mean, we can sit around and talk and speculate, and I have for endless hours, about whether John, Edward is a, uh, John Edwards is a deliberate fraud or not. That, that um, and I have my approach? suspicions. I have my, the psychic, I, I have the medium. Um, I, I have my suspicions about that, but in the end, it doesn't really matter. Um, it's not only hard to determine, as Joe points out, um, but it doesn't really matter. What matters is he's not talking to the freaking dead, and he's taking a lot of money for it. That's what matters. Yeah. Well, one of the problems that I have found, uh, as, as in the pop-off uh, revelation that I made on the Carson show there, we got a great number of letters after pop-off was shown definitively to be a fake and a fraud <laughs> using mechanical and electronic means in order to fool his audiences. And that was actually the, like the most popular TV show at the time, wasn't yeah, it? Oh, yes, yeah. indeed, indeed. Yeah. It, it, was, it was a huge exposure of Popoff. But the letters that we got afterwards, to a large extent, were saying, I'm not going to give that man another dollar. I spent a lot of money sending it off to his ministry. Now I'm going to send it to Reverend so-and-so. <laughs> <laughs> So it, it doesn't always work. You, you wipe one out, but then you can't prove that the other ones are doing similar things unless you investigate each and every one of them. You've got to cause some doubt and ask them to think about other people who are doing perhaps exactly the same thing. Think about that and hold on to your money. There's that old saying about something with rubble duck, rubber ducks? Uh, yeah, yeah. Unsinkable rubber yep. ducks, Randy's, Randy's saying. Um, if I, th I think your question can be prized apart into, into two parts. Um, one is the question of empiricism, and, and that is really skepticism's soul. You know, as soon as we get away from the idea of, of finding out what is actually true and what we can actually demonstrate to be true, then we've just completely lost our way. So empiricism uh, goes straight to your uh, uh, consumer protection question. But the other question is about uh, uh, allocating resources in, with, in a kind of a harm reduction way, like why worry about dowsing when we could be worrying about politics or something like that, right? Some, some, this, some. This, of, this often comes up, and, and my, my answer is two part. One, that, that seemingly uh, trivial issues can sometimes mutate as dowsing has done recently and suddenly become lethal, at which point you need Experts. Yeah. I mean, to, to hear about that? that the Iraq bomb detecting. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And it, I mean, checkpoints throughout Iraq. Lives it gave. Stake. Yeah, and and also used by law enforcement throughout the world. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's part of the answer. The other one is that for these kinds of questions that skeptics have traditionally looked at, nobody else is looking at them. So this goes back to your consumer protection thing as well. That it is a tiny little niche area often not that important in the grand scheme of human experience, but it has been neglected. And so that's why 
That was the original impetus for organized skepticism, and I, I think that's where our most important work remains. So I'm sorry I took the last question, but there it goes. So that was the first panel of the entire con, and we actually started very early, so that's probably true. There's very few panels actually tracks that started this early. So thank you. I mean, we got a full house. How'd that happen? This early. And all these people are going to be on other panels, and uh, some of them are going to do presentations, like Randy will, and, and Jamie is going his thing with Adam later on is going to be really cool. It's got that big room at the Marriott, the atrium ballroom, and uh, Ben has a workshop. And Chupacabra, if you want yes. to learn about the Chupacabra, come on by. I, I've seen the slides for the CI, CSI Paranormal, which kind of looks kind of cool. And then Dan will be around. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we have, there's a, there's booths with more information and other things at, down in the uh, main area near the uh, Walk of Fame for all the skeptic groups. I think CSI and Skeptic Society and the JREF, they all have booths for, with information there and other books and things you can take a look at. I saw a great evolution book. Uh, just there. right out to the main <laughs> area where all the Walk of Fame stars are. It's in the same area. It's like just right across the hall, basically. Yeah. Yeah, so, check out the uh, CSI table. Uh, that's the other CSI, and uh, Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. We publish Skeptical Inquiry magazine, and we have... Now, most of those probably won't be set up for another few hours there. because we started earlier than the con. <laughs> so, yeah, we did. Most things actually don't start today until around, uh, like, 1. Yeah. But I... That's why I, you still get elevators. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah if you, do you actually get an air elevator to stop? Yeah, well, that's the reason why. Um, but yeah, so we're early, so a lot of the stuff isn't actually set up completely yet, so come down later on. But and for those who might be wanting to stop me to have a picture taken with me, I'm very willing, but no film, please, only digital, because I don't show up on film. <laughs> well, your time's out. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>